Hi, everyone. This is Angela Ciolana, one of the hosts of Journeys of Hope. Thanks so much for downloading this Pilgrim Center of Hope podcast. And we are so grateful to our sponsor who made this podcast possible in honor of Valentin, Nicholas, and Francisco Campos. If you also would like to join us as a missionary of hope in this mission, please visit pilgrimcenterofhope.org. Now, here is your journey of hope. Journeys of Hope, an introduction to the Universal Church that promotes an attitude of pilgrimage among the faithful by introducing you to pilgrim destinations around the world. Welcome to Journeys of Hope, your spiritual passport to sacred destinations around the world, placing you in the footsteps of Jesus Christ, the Virgin Mary, the Apostles, and the Saints. I am Mary Jane Fox. And I'm Deacon Tom Fox. And Mary Jane and I co-direct Pilgrim Center of Hope, an evangelization ministry founded in 1993 with a mission of guiding people to Christ and the church through presentations, media productions, conferences, and another part of the ministry is organizing customized and unique pilgrimages. These are journeys of faith to various destinations marked through history where people have been renewed in their spiritual lives healed, and enriched in their faith. For the last 28 years, Pilgrim Center of Hope has led well over 80 authentic spiritual pilgrimages to the Holy Land, Italy, France, Spain, Greece, Turkey, Germany, Marian apparition sites, and beyond. As a result, Journeys of Hope is able to take you to these holy sites. All right. So let's begin our journey. Come with us today on a journey with, uh, to Lanciano, Italy. Lanciano is an ancient town a few miles from the Adriatic coast and in the heart of southeastern corner of the Italian region called Abruzzo. Abruzzo is rich in art and a history that can be traced back over 800 years. Lanciano is also a special destination for pilgrims to see the Eucharistic miracle that took place in the 8th century. Now, this is the earliest recorded Eucharistic miracle, and so has become quite famous. The consecrated host transformed into a piece of a human heart, and the consecrated blood coagulated into five walnut-sized globules. These can be seen today. And today on Journeys of Hope, we will tell you the story of this Eucharistic miracle, how it occurred, and the witness involved. We will also answer questions such as, were there medical um, tests involved? What is the Eucharist? Why is it important for us to be aware of these miracles? And how we can benefit from them. And you will hear about the number of Eucharistic miracles that have been recorded and documented through the world since then. You know, Lanciano is around a couple of hours drive from Rome. It's a very pretty town with its red tile roofs, an interesting historical center, the piazza, a backdrop of snow-capped mountains, and again, the village surrounded by this ancient city walls. Up to the 17th century, Lanciano held friars that would uh, fairs, that is, that would attract merchants from all over Italy because of the town uh, was an agricultural center with its textile, machinery, and furniture ma uh, manufacturers. Its ancient walls date to the 11th century. And there are several Catholic churches. Four of these are the oldest in the town, each having its own unique history. And the oldest is the Church of Santa Maria Maggiore, which was built in the 12th century. Its remarkable bell tower can be seen from a far distance. The Church of uh, San Francesco, or St. Francis, is where the Eucharistic miracle is preserved. It's lo located near the central piazza of the town. It was built in the 13th century Gothic style. Gothic architecture values height and exhibits an intricate and delicate artistic beauty. Though its roots are French, the Gothic approach can be found in churches, cathedrals, and other similar buildings throughout Europe and beyond. 
The church initiated by the Franciscans was built on the site of the monastery ruins of St. Longinus. The name Lanciano, translated to the lance, is in honor of the lance of Longinus, which is said to have pierced the heart of Jesus after his death while he was hanging on the cross. The Roman soldier who carried out this crude act of proof that Jesus was dead was named Longinus. Tradition is, tells us that when blood and water splattered out from the side of Christ, Longinus was showered by it and was in that moment miraculously cured of some sort of eye disease that was gradually robbing him of his eyesight. It is says that as a result of that miracle, Longinus received the gift of faith in Jesus and was later recognized as a saint in the church. St. Longinus' hometown is called Lanciano today. Isn't that an interesting story? Who would have thought? Mm -hmm. You know, so many cities throughout Europe, but even in the U.S., are named after Catholic, um, you know, have Catholic Canonized names. Canonized saints. Canonized yes. saints. Like, yeah. you know, we have Los Angeles, California, and the Angels. Uh, that's, you know, of course. And San Antonio. And San Antonio and <laughs> Corpus Christi, Texas, yeah. which is just so, so interesting. Well, you know, it was in this monastery of St. Longinus that the Eucharistic miracle took place. One of the monks, a priest, was celebrating the holy sacrifice of the Mass. The priest's name is unknown, but he was suffering from recurrent doubts regarding transubstantiation, which is the change of the bread and wine into the body and blood of Jesus Christ. It was during this one Mass that after speaking the solemn words of consecration, when the host was suddenly changed into a circle of flesh, and the wine was transformed into visible blood. He was puzzled at first at what he just witnessed. He spoke to the congregation the following words, O oh, fortunate witnesses to whom the blessed God to confound my unbelief has wished to reveal himself visible to our eyes. Come, brethren, and marvel at our God so close to us. Behold the flesh and blood of our most beloved Christ. Well, you can imagine the congregation was also very puzzled. They rushed to the altar. They saw the miracle and went forth to spread the news to other townspeople who also rushed to the church to witness this Eucharistic miracle for themselves. The flesh, the, the flesh remained intact, but the blood in the chalice soon divided into five globules of unequal sizes and irregular shapes. The monks decided to weigh them. So they went to the archbishop and obtained a scale, and it was discovered that one weighed the same as all five together, two as much as any three, and the smallest as much as, much hmm. as the largest. Again, an unexplainable uh, phenomena. phenomena. Yeah, it's, it's, but I'm so impressed that the friars wanted to make sure that they had a good scale, yeah. and they went to the archbishop to get that correct scale. So uh, the host and the five globules were placed in a reliquary. So let's d define what a reliquary is. It's a special repository in which a relic is sealed and kept. Reliquaries vary in size according to the relic, from very small ones that can be easily carried to larger caskets for whole parts of saints' bodies. Relics are never exposed for public veneration unless enclosed in a reliquary. Some reliquaries are famous for their exquisite design and value. At the time of the miracle, the Church of St. Logisness was staffed by Basilian monks, but it was abandoned by them uh, close to the 12th century. The property passed quickly to the Benedictines and then to the Franciscans, who had to demolish the old church because of damage incurred during earthquakes. The new church was built on the site that was named after St. Francis. The, the church was named after St. Francis. History records that after the miracle was certified, a document telling the details of the miracle written on parchment in both Greek and Latin and has been safeguarded there ever, ever since. So that, that's in the, in the early church, of course, Greek and Latin were, were common languages, especially in the, in, in the church. So that was the right. language, well, Latin the was language the of the church. Ch it's the tongue of Mother yeah. Church. Now, the host is visibly seen as flesh 
in a sculptured silver and crystal monstrance. Monstrance is a symbol of the Blessed Sacrament since the monstrance is a sacred vessel which contains the sacred host when exposed for adoration or carried in procession. The globules of blood are held in a chalice artistically etched in crystal. They are displayed on an altar in the sanctuary of the Church of St. Francis and can be seen today. The flesh is still intact and the, glo and the globules are coagulated blood. You know, Tom, we have been there on the pilgrimage with a group of pilgrims, and I remember seeing that, and it was, it's true. I mean, it, it's so, I mean, I've witnessed it. I've seen this, I've seen this, the miracle. It's in the, the way it's described as now. And then what's so beautiful is that the Franciscans have added a, a hall where they have scientific evidence. And that's really the next point. You know, have there been studies to prove or to, uh, to look at these two incredible um, pieces of you know, the blood and the flesh. A number have been performed throughout the centuries, but in 1970 is the most scientifically complete study, and it is that examination which we need to consider. The task was assigned to a university professor in Italy specializing in anatomy and pathology. He was also um, specialized in chemistry and clinical micro microscopy. He and others gathered in the sacristy of the Church of St. Francis on November 18, 1970. The Archbishop of Lanciano and his secretary, the Bishop of Ortona from a nearby town, the Chancellor of the Archdiocese, the Provincial of the Friars, and the entire community of Franciscan Friars were present with the professor. So there had to be witnesses of this gathering of evidence. The flesh was described as being yellow-brown in color, irregular and roundish in shape, thicker and wrinkled along the periphery, becoming gradually thinner as it reached the center area, where the tissue was a bit frayed. A small sample was taken from a thicker part for examination in the laboratory of the hospital. On examining the five globules of blood, it was noted that the phenomena regarding their weight was no longer evident as it was last originally noted. Interesting. A small sample was taken from the central part of one globule for microscopic examination and scientific study. Later, after all of the, these um, pieces were gathered and were completed, the fragments of both relics were returned to the, ch to the church. So the conclusions reached by the professor were presented months later in March the following year in 1971. As a result of the microscopic studies, the following facts were ascertained and documented. The fact that the flesh was identified as muscle tissue of the my myocardium, which is the heart wall, having no trace whatsoever of any materials or agents used for the preservation of flesh. Both the flesh and the sample of blood were found to be of human origin, definitely excluding the possibility that it was from an animal species. species. The blood and the flesh were found to belong to the same blood type, AB. And the blood of the Eucharistic miracle was found to contain the following minerals, chlorides, phosphorus, magnesium, potassium, sodium in a lesser degree, and a greater quantity of calcium, and these minerals, uh, minerals are found in the human body. The professor further noted that the blood, had it been taken from a cadaver, would have already rapidly uh, uh, decayed, but it wasn't, the, of course, it wasn't the case in this study. In regard to the blood, the scientists emphasized that the blood group is the same as that of the man of the shroud. Another very in interesting, uh, very the, interesting the point. Of Turin? The shroud of Turin. The shroud of Turin. That's amazing, Tom. Uh, yeah. That that blood was the same type, A yeah. B of the shroud of Turin. His findings conclusively exclude the possibility of fraud perpetrated centuries ago. Yes. In fact, he argued that only a hand experienced an antimonic, antimonic. <laughs> and atomic uh, dissection uh, could have obtained from a hollow eternal organ like the heart such an expert cut, that is, a round cut thick at the outer edges, lessening gradually 
and uniformly into nothing in, in the central area. So it's, it's not something that, that someone uh, could just cut. Uh, it, it, it was almost impossible that this could be done with such perfection. Yes. Uh, that also uh, testifies to, to its reality. Mm -hmm. uh, the doctor ended his report by stating that while the flesh and blood were concerned in receptacles not tightly sealed, they were not damaged, although they had been exposed to the influence of physical, atmospheric, and biological agents. So, in other words, uh, the, these two relics, he's saying, were, were conserved in, in containers that weren't really tightly sealed right. all through the ages. Yeah. And so it still wasn't affected yeah. you know, through and, so, and, and again, it almost reminds you of the, of the shroud all through the ages of his travels and how it was not, uh, not really protected. So this report was presented before ecclesiastical officials, the local assembly, medical and scientific professionals, as well as uh, judicial, political, and military authorities. So it was a, quite a spectrum of people that were there, uh, witnesses of the this, of this study. Oh my goodness! So they, I mean, what more evidence do we need? Yeah. Uh, this is indeed an incredible list of facts proving it is not a fraud, proving it is authentically human flesh and blood. This Eucharistic miracle that occurred over a thousand years ago remains a sign for all of us to ponder. These two relics, the flesh and blood, can be seen today in the Church of St. Francis in Lanciano. And that is why this is referred to so often as the miracle of Lanciano. So what is there for pilgrims to see when they arrive at this Church of St. Francis? As mentioned earlier, the church is under the, the custody of the Franciscans. So the Franciscan friars are always present. And, of course, as we know, that Lanciano has been a pilgrim destination for Catholics from all over the world for many years, as it is recognized as an authentic Eucharistic miracle, and the Church has recognized it as well as an authentic miracle because of its, of its um, preservation, its scientific evidence. And the friars, so what they do is they welcome visitors, they welcome pilgrims who want to see the Eucharistic miracle of Anciano. They've even built an exhibition hall right next to the church. And as you go into this hall, you see scientific evidence for those who maybe still wonder, or, you know, or doubt, or maybe never yeah. heard of it and just happened to fall upon it. You know, nothing is coincidental and uh, <laughs> everything is providential. If somebody happens to be in Lanciano and they walk in this church and they see this and they wonder, hmm, what is this? Well, the Franciscan friars have everything there for the visitor to ponder, to learn, to discover, to be enriched. They even provide a video of the story of the miracle. So to us, it's, it's fascinating. But, you know, people may wonder, well, well, what is the Eucharist? Well, that's that's fundamental. It's because of the of the reality of the presence of Jesus Christ in, in the Eucharist. It makes all of this uh, study uh, essential uh, to our faith. Uh, the Holy Eucharist is, is both a, a sacrament, the sacrament of the church, but it's a sacrifice. Uh, because of the passion and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. In the Holy Eucharist, under the appearance of the bread and wine, the whole Christ is really and truly substantially present. We use the words really, truly, and substantially to describe Christ's presence in the Holy Eucharist in order to distinguish our Lord's teaching from others who falsely teach that the Eucharist is only a sign or a symbol of, of Christ. Since the time of Christ, all Christians, with few minor exceptions, held the, uh, the true doctrine of the real presence until the Protestant Reformation in the 16th century. Mm, yes, that's true. That's, again, another thing that we need to be reminded of. What does the Church specifically teach, then, about the bread and wine turning into the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus? What does this mean? Well, the Lord Jesus, on the night before he suffered on the cross, shared one last meal with his disciples. And during this meal, our Savior instituted the sacrament of his body and blood. He did this in order to perpetuate the sacrifice of the cross throughout the ages and to entrust to the church his spouse a memorial of his death and resurrection. And as the Gospel of Matthew tells us, 
quote, While they were eating, Jesus took bread, said the blessing, broke it, and giving it to his disciples said, Take and eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which will be shed on behalf of many for the forgiveness of sins. This is also recorded in the Gospels of uh, Mark and Luke. So recalling these words of Jesus, the Catholic Church professes that in the celebration of the Eucharist, bread and wine become the body and blood of Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit and the instrumentality of the priest. Jesus said, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever, and the bread that I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. This is found in the Gospel of John, chapter 6. So our Lord was able to change bread and wine into his body and blood by his almighty power. God, you know, why should we doubt? God, who created all things from nothing, who fed the 5,000 with five loaves and two fish, who changed water into wine instantaneously at the wedding feast of Cana, who raised the dead to life, and there were witnesses, specifically we're talking about Lazarus, can change bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ. Although the Holy Eucharist is a great mystery and consequently beyond human understanding, the principles of sound reason can show that this great gift is not impossible by the power of Almighty God. And this is what Church means when she speaks of the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. The risen Christ is present to his church in many ways. Yes, but most especially through the sacrament of his body and blood. Christ is present in his word, the scripture. He is present in the assembly. He is present in his priest. And of course, he is present but par excellence in the Eucharist, which is his body, blood, soul, and divinity. Yes, and and again, bringing back to going back to the reality that it is it's truly a mystery, but it's been witnessed by the church through the ages. The saints documented. There's so many documented uh, stories of the saints and the importance of uh, how the Eucharist was so important to them. That this reality of, of Jesus Christ, um, and uh, you know, of course, even now. 2,000 years later, there, there are people who doubt. But even in the very beginning, there, uh, in the Gospel of John, when Jesus gives the teaching of the Eucharist, there were those of his disciples that refused to believe. Because the, the reality of what Jesus t- teaching, it, it conflicts with our human logic. Our, our, if, we, if we limit um, what we believe, just to what we understand, then we're going to miss much of what the Lord teaches. And, and, the, and the Gospel of John said there were many disciples who would no longer follow, follow Jesus because they found the teaching too, too difficult to believe. And, and so he looked at Peter and the disciples and said, well, you all, will you also leave? And Peter said, Lord, to hell, who else will we go? We have come to believe that you are the Savior. And they, they put their total trust in him. And they, even though they didn't understand, they believed what Jesus was teaching. And it was not until the Last Supper when Jesus then says, this is my body and this is my blood, that everything came together from that teaching uh, that, was, that we have in the Gospel of John, yeah. finally. In, in the Last Supper, it came together for, for uh, the apostles to understand. Mm-hmm. So, when you receive the Holy Eucharist, you are intimately united with Jesus Christ. He literally becomes part of you. Yes. Also, by taking the Eucharist, you express your union with all Catholics who believe all that the Church teaches throughout the world. This sense of participation in a larger community is why Catholics have a strict law that Only people who are in communion with the church can receive Holy Communion. In other words, 
those who are united in the same beliefs are allowed to receive Holy Communion. It's, it's fundamental that you must believe what you're receiving, but it's not only that you believe that this is truly Jesus Christ in the Eucharist, but you believe what the church teaches because you can't just separate out one teaching from another. So to receive the Eucharist, one must be fully incorporated into the Catholic Church, which means to be to be baptized and to receive the uh, the sacrament of reconciliation and the, the first first Holy Communion, uh, and then of course later on. Uh, the, the sacraments of, of confirmation to be strengthened in the gifts of the Holy Spirit and, and uh, so forth. So uh, all, of it is, all of it is a part of, of God's great plan. So also important for receiving Holy Communion is the spirit of recollection, recollection and prayer, yes. observance of, a, of the fast prescribed by the church and a, an appropriate disposition of the, of the body. Uh, that's mean to, by our, our, our appearance, our, that we dress with respect and, and, and gestures. And then, of course, that fast, it's only it's for one hour from everything except uh, water and medicine. So, and is it, so is it required for Catholics to believe this? Yes. Of yes, course it is. to be Catholic yeah. is to believe and accept the teaching of Jesus Christ and, and the institution he gave us, the one holy Catholic apostolic church. So we as Catholics believe in the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist, meaning that what appears to be bread and wine is really Jesus' body and blood and not just a symbol of blood. Mm -hmm. And when, when we receive Holy Communion, it's an expression of the unity among all of those in communion with the Catholic Church throughout the whole world. Uh, who maintain a belief in the real presence of Jesus. Therefore, only those who believe in the true presence may participate in this sacrament of, of oneness uh, with Christ and with the Church. Yes. What if we are struggling to believe in the real presence as a Catholic? Well, you know, we can be reminded of the following, the words of our Lord Jesus Christ as recorded in the Gospel of John chapter 6. And you've mentioned that earlier, Tom. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the words of Christ tell us, he tells us, I am the bread of life. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. These words are from the lips of the Son of God, our Savior. These words are of truth. And of course, there's, there is no other place in Scripture where Jesus repeats the same message four times in succession as he does on, in this gospel uh, to, to make uh, to really emphasize the importance of this teaching. Mm -hmm. So take these words to prayer. Tell the Lord in your own words of your struggle uh, to understand this mystery. Of course, it's a mystery, but uh, when we are confronted with mystery, we ask God, especially for the mysteries that we are uh, that, that we are obliged to to believe. believe we ask faith. God for the grace to to assist yes. us, which He will always which He will always uh, give us. So we be reminded that the Eucharist is someone, not something. That's a, that's a key point. It is. That, that it's not just about a teaching, it's about the person of Jesus Christ. John Paul II said, in that little host is a solution to the problems of the world. It's because in that host is Jesus Christ and he is the solution. So go to church and sit before the, the Eucharist reserved in the tabernacle and we know where the tabernacle is located because of a red perpetual candle burning. And simply be there. Even if, uh, even for someone who is struggling or, or who doesn't believe, recall the words from the Gospel of John that we, have just, uh, that we have just read and mention to the Lord, Lord Jesus, I, I know these are your words. Help me, help me to embrace them, uh, to hold on to them. Uh, and maybe we begin with, you know, I, I, I believe, but help my unbelief. Believe, Be yes. Yes. And so, Eucharistic miracle, <laughs> I got a tongue tied today. 
Uh, there are many that have been documented uh, from this very first one at Lanciano. Yes. Uh -huh. So they're available. You can read about them. That's right. And you know, Tom, as you were talking about the Eucharist being someone, not something, I'm reminded of a story of uh, St. John Vianney, who is a, a priest in France who became a saint, and he was a pastor, had a pastor's heart, and he would see one of his parishioners in his church spend hours sitting in the church alone looking at the tabernacle and so so father john viani went up to him and said so what are you doing he goes i'm looking at him and he's looking at me pointing to the tabernacle such simplicity such faith such openness and saint john viani actually recorded that in his um you know, his own journal or writing, because it, there was a good point. And as you mentioned, you know, to be to be present before the Eucharist and to speak to the Lord. Yeah, yes, it takes faith. You know, Father Tom Hanks, he's a pastor in Kansas. Well, he gave a reflection about the Eucharist, and I think he gives us some good guidance here, as I like to quote him, and we can together learn from him. He says, in the Eucharist, we are confronted with the ultimate mystery of God's love for each and every one of us, personally and it's accepting the mystery of God's love for us that God became human in Jesus God's love is manifested upon the cross God's love is revealed in the resurrection and the promise of eternal life and so we are invited to recognize with Peter Lord where else would you, we go you truly have the words of eternal life so Jesus is saying to us in every Eucharist I want to be in union with you. I want to be part of your life. I want to be there to grace and to strengthen you. I want to be there in the good times and in the difficult times. And I want you to know the power of my love and the salvation that I offer. That's the mystery of God's love for us. And it's approaching the Eucharist in a true act of faith. These are the words of Father. You know, I think, Tom, his words give us a good inspiration and guidance and direction because he's reminding us of what Jesus is telling us in so many words. I, he wants to be in union with us and be a part of our lives. He's wait, he waits for us. Yes. And to take the words of Jesus as fact and not, and not try to, um, to put them into a, a something else that help us to understand. No, we just take the words of Jesus as fact. We don't. We don't need to interpret what he, what he said. He, uh, what he said is is, is reality and truth. So then, uh, why don't miracles like this happen all the time? Well, Eucharistic miracles occur every, every day, day in all the Catholic churches when bread and wine is changed into the body and blood of Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit through the minister of the of the priest. In other words. What, what it is becomes Jesus. It still maybe it looks and, and tastes like like bread, but because of the uh, of the transubstantiation at, at every mass, it is a supernatural miracle. Bread and wine become the body and blood of Jesus Christ through the power again through the power of the Holy Spirit. It's it's not a natural thing happening. It's supernatural. So our faith. Is, of course, it's not founded on miracles, but it's supported by them. A Christian isn't ob obliged to believe in miracles. Uh, these miracles do not bind the faithful to believe in them, even if they are officially recognized by the church. And when you're talking about the like the documented Eucharistic miracle, like the miracle. well, any any uh, well, the miracles of, belief, of Jesus, yes, we, we but we're talking about those uh, miracles that have happened since that time of Christ. There, there are uh, saints that have had. Uh, healings many and... yeah many miracles and and even in Lourdes there's I think 168 approved scientific miracles that people have been healed through the waters so, uh, you don't have to really believe in those miracles but we do have to believe in the healing power of, of, of Jesus Christ, Christ. Yes. so our faith is not founded on miracles it's supported by them Okay. So we don't have to, we don't necessarily have to, to believe in these miracles, but we do have to believe uh, in the true and real presence of Jesus Christ in the Eucharist. Uh, St. Cyril, Cyril, a doctor of the church and bishop of Jerusalem in the year uh, 350 A.D., he summarizes things beautifully for us when he says, Do not therefore regard the bread and wine as simply just that. 
for they are, according to the Master's declaration, the body and blood of Christ. Even though the senses suggest to you the other, let faith make you firm. Do not judge in this matter by taste, but fully assured by faith. So again, it's faith uh, that, that prevails in the mysteries that God presents us with. And, and that's where we look, uh, the church def defines uh, how we are to believe. Mm -hmm. it's, there, it's the authority of the, of the church is there to, to guide us. Yes. You know, it reminds me of Jesus tells us often in the Gospels, what is needed is faith. You know, worry is least useless. What is needed is trust and faith. So, yes, uh, go to Jesus and tell him of your struggles. He will help you, but he waits for you to come to him because we have a free will. And you may want to learn more about the other Eucharistic miracles to inspire you. And there have been roughly 108 documented cases of these kinds of miracles around the world and numerous stories of conversion and miracles in relation to the Eucharist. I mean, there have been saints, and this has been documented, and even 20th century modern-day saints who have lived solely on the Eucharist for years. No food, but just the Eucharist. What a great mystery. When we, when we think about Eucharistic miracles, we may be tempted to think that most of them are unsubstantiated stories that only happened in the old days and couldn't happen today in our modern age of science. Well, the last few decades, however, have seen a surge in Eucharistic miracles which cannot be disputed by science. So, and, and, and in most of these recent miracles, the Eucharist turns into human flesh and blood. And it's interesting that all of them, yes. it's the same blood type. Exactly. There's been, a, as I said, 108, but the one thing that they all have in common is the same blood type, AB. AB. The consistency among the scientific results is startling. That's true, Tom. It is just amazing to see that science, the, science, the, the facts from science. We invite you to visit our website, pilgrimcenterofhope.org, for a link to read about these miracles. Uh, the link is called An International Exhibition Design and created by Carlo Acutis. Now, uh, this, uh, this link will lead you to the list of all the Eucharist miracles throughout the world. It's, um, and you, they're listed by country. And Car so let me tell you a little bit about the person who actually created this website. Carlo Acutis was a young adult who was beatified by Pope Francis in October of 2020, making him the first millennial to be put on the path to Catholic sainthood, because he was born in 1991. And from an early age, Carlo seemed to have a special love for God, even though his parents were not devout Catholics. It was not his parents bringing Carlo to Mass, but it was he who managed to get himself to Mass and to convince others to receive communion, the Holy Eucharist daily. He had a great devotion to the Holy Eucharist. He loved Christ. And, of course, they lived in, in uh, North Italy, and um, he was able to hear about many of the stories that uh, of the Eucharist miracles there in Italy. But, and he became a source of conversion for his parents. That's right, he did, Yeah. as time but, goes on. So let yeah. me tell you a little bit more about, yes, the story. So Carlo loved soccer and video games. You know, he was a common teenage boy, right? Mm -hmm. He tried to stay disciplined, though, and only played games for one hour a week, even though he really wanted to play much more. But he wanted to spend time and have a balance in his life with his school studies, with prayer. And he also bought computer programming books and taught himself computer coding and animation, which is where he was able to create this wonderful website that you will see soon see. He had a great devotion to Mary, the Mother of God, and loved to pray the rosary. He went to Mass often, and he also went to confession quite often. He loved the Eucharist and was fascinated so fascinated by Eucharistic miracles. He asked his parents to take him on pilgrimages to the places of the saints and to the sites of these Eucharistic miracles. Using his research, he began creating what would, would eventually become a catalog uh, or a, a website to catalog and share the information with others. 
Carlo was concerned that so many people were growing distant to the church and the sacraments and desperately wanted them to come back to the church. And on the site, he has many quotes, and he would often say, the more often we receive the Eucharist, the more we will become like Jesus, so that on this earth we will have a foretaste of heaven. And, of course, that's, that's what the Lord's plan is. He loves us so much that he gives us himself in the Eucharist, but he wants that once we receive him, to that design. with the help of his grace, that we do transform our lives to become a, a reflection of, of him and, and all that he's taught. Mm -hmm. At age 15, Carlo was diagnosed with untreatable leukemia. He offered up his suffering for others coping with illness, and he said, I offer all the sufferings I will have uh, to suffer for the Lord, for the Pope, and the Church. Carlo died from his illness on October the 12th in the year 2006. At his request, he was buried in Assisi because of his love for St. Francis. His cause for canonization began in 2013. Pope Francis beatified Carlo on October the 10th of 2020. His tomb was opened and his intact body lied in repose in a glass tomb where he could be venerated by pilgrims through October the 17th of that year. The rector of the church in Assisi, where Acutus, uh, his tomb was located, called him a witness that holiness is attainable for teenagers. Quote, for the first time in history, um, we see a saint dressed in jeans, sne uh, sneakers, and a sweater. This is a great message for us. We can feel holiness is not a distant thing, but is something very much within, within everyone's reach, because the Lord is the Lord of everyone." Unquote. Mm -hmm. Pope Francis described Carlo as a young adult of the Internet age and a model of holiness for the digital age. Carlo spent time adoring Jesus in the Eucharist, and he, he said, Jesus is my great friend, and the Eucharist is my highway to heaven. He also said, to always be close to Jesus, that is my life plan, unquote. Such wisdom yeah. for such a young man. Yes. So go to our website, friends. Go to pilgrimcenterofhope.org for the link uh, to the website that Carlo compiled listing the Eucharistic miracles. That's pilgrimcenterofhope.org. Again, his words, to always be close to Jesus, that is my life plan. The words of Carlo can inspire us to have this desire as well, to embrace Jesus. Um, this is the, indeed the plan for each of us. In, in relation um, to this topic, something else has come up that's quite, it's very connected with the Eucharist, and that's the Church has declared the Feast of Corpus Christi, and that is in our liturgical calendar once a year. And of course, Corpus Christi in Latin means Body of Christ. It celebrates the real presence of Jesus Christ in the Eucharist, and it is celebrated on the Sunday, the Sunday following the Feast of the Holy Trinity. But there's a story behind this feast day that also is, involves a Eucharistic miracle, which is quite interesting. Yes. Um, so it was in the, in the year 1263, a German priest, Father Peter of Prague, made a pilgrimage to Rome. He stopped at Bolinza, Italy to celebrate Mass at the Church of St. Christina. At the time, he was having doubts about Jesus being truly present in the Blessed Sacrament. He was affected by the growing debate among certain theologians who, for the first time in the history of the Church, began introducing doubts about the body and blood of Christ being actually present in the consecrated bread and wine. In response to this, his doubt, when he recited the prayer of consecration as he celebrated the Holy uh, Mass, blood started seeping from the consecrated host onto the altar and the corporal. Father Peter uh, reported this miracle to Pope Urban IV, who at the time was at a nearby town of Orvieto. Mm -hmm. The Pope sent delegates to investigate and ordered that the host and the bloodstained corporal be brought to Orvieto. The relics were then placed in the, in the cathedral of Orvieto, where they remain today and still can be seen. Amazing. You know, um, I'm just so glad that we hear that we heard that story 
that's behind the Feast of Corpus Christi. And in every diocese, like in our diocese, the Archbishop celebrates a Eucharistic procession with the Blessed Sacrament in the monstrance through the streets or at the cathedral here in San Antonio. But many dioceses throughout the world have Eucharist miracle, uh, sorry, processions uh, in on this Feast of Corpus Christi, or even a, a, your own local parish might have that. So keep that in mind when, when that comes up. Um, this Eucharistic miracle confirmed the visions that confirmed what well, that were given to Saint uh, Juliana in Belgium in the year 1258. <laughs> Saint Juliana was a nun and mystic who had a series of visions in which she was instructed by our Lord to work to establish a liturgical feast for the Holy Eucharist, to which she had a great devotion. And after many years of trying, she finally convinced the bishop, the future Pope Urban IV, to create the special feast in honor of the Blessed Sacrament, where none had existed before. And soon after her death, Pope Urban IV instituted Corpus Christi for the Universal Church and celebrated for the first time in Orvieto in 1264, a year after the Eucharistic miracle that is now held in Orvieto. Mm -hmm. I mean, how interesting the connection there. Mm -hmm. Inspired by the miracle, Pope Urban commissioned a Dominican friar, and you may recall his name, I mean, remember his name when I say it, St. Thomas Aquinas. Now, St. Thomas Aquinas composed the Mass and the office for the Feast of Corpus Christi. And some of his many hymns in honor of the Holy Eucharist are Tantum Ergo, Panis Angelicus, O Solitaris Ostia. And these are beloved hymns that the church sings on the Feast of Corpus Christi, as well as throughout the year when we have exposition and benediction of the Blessed Sacrament, when we have holy hours with our community. These are prayers that are most are sung in, still in the Latin language or sometimes in English. So again, the history of the Feast of Corpus Christi is connected to a Eucharistic miracle. How many of us knew that? The liturgical calendar of our church is rich, and there's some, there's history bef behind each of its feast days. So when you turn the calendar, you look on the on the calendar. If you do have a Catholic calendar hanging on your wall, or um, you you would think about these things. You know, next time you see a feast, maybe wonder. Hmm, I wonder what the history behind this feast day is, and share it with your family. It's a great way to learn. And, you know, we want to encourage you to, to grow closer to Christ, to embrace the Eucharist, to run to Him. Here are three simple things that we can do to strengthen our Eucharistic belief. And as we strengthen ours, maybe it will reach someone else too. And we have taken some notes from an article written by Father Edward Looney. He's a priest of the Diocese of Green Bay who writes beautifully about Eucharistic adoration and devotion. Well, first... Let's reclaim Sunday Mass. Maybe part of the problem has been the laxity with which we approach our Sunday obligation. So many things seem to take priority over Sunday Mass. But by making Sunday a priority, we proclaim our faith in God and our desire to worship Him. And that this is Jesus in the Eucharist and in His Word whom we receive. That nothing, including youth athletics tournaments, or professional sports, or shopping takes priority over reaching the God of the universe. The next time you want to skip Sunday Mass, remind yourself who it is that you will not receive. Then drop everything and run to Mass. Yes, and, and of course, uh, uh, the second one, would to be alert at the consecration. Uh, many, there's many churches that ring bells during the consecration. And this is to alert us to the fact that something very special is happening, that the Holy Spirit is being called down by the priest. And then at, at the point of elevation, that Jesus is present in the host that we adore. So the bells are also reminding us to look up, to look at the host being elevated by the priest. It's a powerful moment of grace. So at the consecration, make a declaration of faith in our heart my Lord and my God. Or if you're still struggling a, a little bit with your belief, you might say, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. Hearing these words of consecration, this is my body, and this 
as the chalice of my blood, it reinforces uh, for us who it is that we are now supposed to be adoring uh, during the elevation. All right. And thirdly, pray a holy hour. Make an appointment with God is what I say. Some parishes might have an hour of adoration once a week or once a month, while others have perpetual adoration. And this is a time for prolonged prayer before the exposed blessed sacrament in the monstrance, before Jesus himself. And if we struggle with Eucharistic belief, time before the blessed sacrament opens us to God's grace. Jesus is present in the doubts that we have wanting to reveal himself to us simply by being present before the monstrance and beholding the Eucharist can increase our Eucharistic belief. And so really, all of this is about having a personal relationship with Jesus. Many uh, Christians speak about the importance of this, of a personal relationship with Jesus, but it was Pope Benedict XVI that pointed out, today there is a need to rediscover that Jesus Christ is not just a private conviction or an abstract idea, but a real person who is becoming part of human history is capable of renewing the life of every man and woman, hence the Eucharist as the source and summit of the church's life and mission, must be translated into spirituality, into a life lived according to the Spirit. Very good. That's a beautiful quote of Pope Benedict XVI. So the jewel for the journey on us, our tradition for journeys of hope, is from Blessed Charles of Foucault. It's one of my favorites about the Eucharist. Wherever the sacred host is, there is the living God. There is your Savior as truly as when he lived and spoke in Judea and Galilee, and as truly as he is now in paradise. The Jewel for the Journey is on our website, and we end with, with prayer. prayer. O Jesus, present in the sacrament of the altar, teach all nations to serve you with a willing heart, knowing that to serve God is to reign. May your sacrament, O Jesus, be a light to the mind, strength to the will, joy to the heart. May it be the support for the weak, the comfort for the suffering, and the wayfaring bread of salvation for the dying, and for all the pledge of a future glory. Amen. Amen. We want to thank you for being with us on this journey of hope. This is a production of Pilgrim Center of Hope. We are here to guide people to Christ and the church. Because we are a pilgrim people, always remember to live your journey with hope. Journeys of Hope, a ministry of Pilgrim Center of Hope, guiding people to Christ. Visit us on our website, pilgrimcenterofhope.org. Journeys of Hope, a production of Pilgrim Center of Hope, guiding people to Christ. Visit our website at pilgrimcenterofhope.org.